I'm Steve Wenzel. I'm the manager of the Mount Moore Stam and Recreation Area, and joined by Jess Levinson. And then uh, today at work, we we have um, our maintenance crew members who will meet here in a little bit, probably. There's John Alford down there on the parapet with Shannon Gordon here. John's a maintenance work leader, and Shannon's a a laborer. And they're just finishing up on uh, actually one of our periodic inspection items uh, down in the dam. Uh, Ron Godown, our electrician's uh, working in the dam right now as well. And uh, Dan Favre, our maintenance mechanics in the dam is, uh, today. And then uh, we've got the William B. Hoyt II Visitor Center over here. I don't know if the thing shut off or if it just goes blank. It just goes blank. Oh, okay. And uh, we've got, you know, our, our recreation crew members in there, park rangers um, and natural resource management specialists and some administrative buildings in the back. Uh, we've got playground areas over here on the left. Um, access to uh, literally hundreds of miles of trails uh, outside of our parking lot here. And, you know, we're helping to manage and maintain um, and operate the Mount Morris Dam and also the 3,800 acres of property that uh, the federal government owns here uh, that is beautifully situated in uh, or surrounded by Letchworth State Park. And we're here at a great time of year. We're at near peak foliage um, for the season, so there's an increase in people coming here to check things out you can see the canada geese coming in to to hang out here for a while with us they love hanging out in our stilling basin you can see the dam down here um some folks will ask well why isn't there water behind it uh so the dam is operated as a uh, as a dry dam so that means that we're basically maximizing our storage uh, capacity so that we have enough available for major rain events so if we had a, a bunch of rain on the way let's say some of the uh, tropical systems that have been in the on the southern uh, southeastern uh, part of the United States start making their way up here, um, and they dump a whole bunch of rain in a short amount of time. We've got enough room, storage room back here, to hold quite a bit of rain, and uh, that's what we're here for. And it's worked pretty doggone well for a long time. We've prevented over three billion dollars worth of damages uh, since uh, 1950 was the first event we started. Uh, helping out with flood risk management for, for downstream communities. What's that over there? So that, it looks like a plowed area kind of, and there's like a yellow thing in front of it. Um, and what you're looking at is our debris boom. So that's actually um, a whole bunch of little segments that are attached to a chain. And those things float on the lake level. So as the lake starts to build up here, if we were withholding some water, um, it'll float along the top of the lake and collect the debris that's floating downstream behind it. And every year we come in here, big heavy equipment, and gather all that debris up and uh, ship the and stuff, all the trees on it, and then gather up any trash, and then we, we haul it out of here. Um, so it's all, and it's, it's already happened here at the end of summertime, so that's why it looks like it's all clear. If you come back in the springtime, there'll be a bunch of trees and stuff trapped behind it. And you can see it's not 100%. Um, penetrable there. We, we have debris on the upstream side of the dam that sneaks by it. Um, and we do get to that if it's going to impact our operations of the dam itself, but it's it's pretty much okay where it is. We'll, it'll reflow the next time we have a rain event. So this is 1,028 feet across this bridge here. And it's about 245 feet tall. And it's a pretty massive structure. 750,000 cubic yards of concrete. And you can kind of see those individual monolith joints running down this, kind of vertically down the side of the dam. And then each of the horizontal left joints has this construction handle. You kind of try to imagine yourself being a worker here, say in the, in the winter time of 1949, with a big uh, cable way slung across the gorge, bringing in giant buckets of concrete to your work site, 22 tons per core, and uh, placing that concrete. And it, it doesn't look super impressive at the moment because we we don't have much for flow going through. But if you can imagine, if we had a, a fairly deep lake, when the water exits those conduits, it's it's at a pretty high velocity. So they built this stilling basin back here. You've got a training wall on each side of the dam uh, that are big thick uh, pieces of concrete, and then underneath is a big concrete layer with a bunch of uh, like concrete teeth coming out of the bottom. And when that water comes down through those conduits, it runs into those teeth and takes a lot of the energy out of it so it doesn't cause a bunch of uh, erosion in downstream areas. So we're at the, uh, we're in the, what's called the upper gallery of the dam. 
and this goes through the top of the spillway section. The spillway is that area that's curved in the center. You could actually allow for water flowing over the top if we really had to in an extreme event. But anyway, down below us, about 200 feet, are where the conduits pass from one, the upstream side of the dam to the downstream side. And what we can see in here, down here, is the ventilation from that uh, conduit. So today we have a half gate opening. There's a lot of air that's getting trapped in there as the water passes beneath that half gate. And that air is ventilated all the way up here to the upper gallery. And it'll be captured on the video, but you can um, you can smell it. You get a little bit of that hydrogen sulfide smell from that, that water going through there. Um, you can feel this air that's just constantly blowing out of here being ventilated. Um, if we had a, a half uh, full period, so if, if our um, water elevation on the upstream side of the dam was up close to 100 feet, for example, which is not, uh, that's not unusual for any given springtime, and we operated at half gate like we're doing right now, it would be violent in here. I mean, it would, like you walk by this thing and, and it's, your ears are popping, um, it'll suck the hat right off your head and then kind of breathe it back out. You, can, you know, you can feel it suction your hand there and then, and then come back. And it feels like something breathing. I mean, it really feels like a, it's like a monster breathing down at the bottom of that tunnel. So it's kind of a cool thing to experience. It doesn't make it real pleasant to work in here while that's, while that's going on, but um, yeah. It's, so this is a kind of a living, changing environment as well. In a normal year, we'd get uh, tens of thousands of visitors through here. And then we would typically take about 8,000 people on tour down inside of the dam. This year obviously was a bit different, but we still still had about 100 and just a little less than 160,000 people visit um, our area. So approaching the front desk, we've got uh, Alex Fendice, he's a park ranger here with us. What's up? Alex, this is Jeff Slevinson from uh, Public Affairs. We're recording a bunch of stuff. Um, you can see our COVID, some of our COVID protocols in place. We've got you know, trying to keep social distance. We got the mandatory mask wear inside the building going on. Um, so if you could, you could hook us up. Thanks, man. And then, uh, you know, the tables for standoff distances, got the plexi part in there, and then we've got a, a sanitization regime that we're, we're doing here daily to make sure that uh, we help protect the public and also our employees. This uh, visitor center was completed um, over 20 years ago now. You see Alex uh, dealing with some, some visitors there. We typically have a media room set up in the next area where we're showing a, a video about the dam. That might be something we actually need some help with in, in years to come with uh, reproducing because um, it's getting a little bit dated. But inside the visitor center here, you can see that uh, we have exhibits to help describe um, why the dam is here in the first place, some of the historical flooding. Yeah, nice. You can see, uh, you know, floods ripping down through the city of Rochester. And this is in 1865. So if you had the same, you know, the current level of infrastructure along the river now, you can imagine how, how devastating a flood like this would really be, uh, how costly. So there was a real need for uh, some kind of flood protection. And of course, uh, they turned to the... Uh, Army Corps of Engineers, after exhausting state resources on it. And uh, this dam was authorized by Congress in, under the Flood Control Act 1944. And then uh, they chose this location so we could use the gorge itself as the reservoir. So we can impound water behind the dam um, without flooding on a bunch of communities, for example, or farmlands and that kind of thing. So we're able to fluctuate that lake level as needed to uh, to have that level of protection without impacting other people too bad. And you can see, you know, massive construction effort and to excavate in, into the side of the gorge, build a keyway in here, coffer off part of the river so they could get to the uh, bedrock and then just start building from the bottom up all these different sections of the dam called monoliths. They're like little independent towers or big independent towers. They're all just sandwiched in here between the gorge. In this image, you can actually see Half of the dam is constructed, and then water's passing over some, a part of it, while the other half is in the dry. And they're working on it night and day. You can see in some of these pictures they have uh, lights strung across the the gorge there, so they work on it at night, and then summer and winter they they just worked on it straight through. I mean, that's so much, so much of rock. It's massive, yeah, for sure, and it's a big dam. There's over seven hundred and fifty thousand 
cubic yards of concrete uh, that make it up. So it was a pretty massive uh, project. And it can hold back about 302,000 acre feet of water. So that's a lot. It's about 98 billion gallons back there when we're full. It's just now beginning to fully dry. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of weird to think about, but the concrete's actually stronger now than it was uh, at first construction. Oh, all right, cool. Which is a good thing. Yeah. You got some folks that ask us, why, why isn't this a hydro project? Um, basically, if, we, if it was going to be, it would have to be bigger. Uh, in order to provide the, flood, uh, the level of flood protection that, that it affords, um, you'd need to have more storage capacity to also have a lake deep enough to produce hydro. So um, it was considered at the time, all dams that were under the uh, Flood Control Act of 44 had to have some provision for potential hydropower. So we have a couple of pen stocks that were built into the dam um, that are just capped off. Um, it was investigated again in the, in the mid-1980s. Um, they did a feasibility study and looked into options for, for adding like a tainer gate system across the top or building another flood control project upstream. And all of that discussion and, and feasibility study led to folks saying, wait a minute, we don't want to see a constant lake inside of the Letchworth Gorge. This had become a really big um, state park uh, in the meantime. And so in the mid uh, 1980s or late 1980s, they passed a, a law that said you will not do anything with this dam other than flood risk management. So we don't want to see hydropower or recreational lake or anything like that. So, so that's what we do. We we let the water go when we can and store it when we have to. Uh, here's some good examples of when we had to store a lot of water. Um, Hurricane Agnes in 1972 uh, dumped enough rainfall in a short amount of time in the in the uh, watershed that. The dam filled all the way up to the top, you know, just a couple feet from overflowing the spillway. Um, so that was some some hairy times. You can actually see in this picture all the spectators on the top of the gorge. Oh yeah, just looking at how's this dam going to hold up. Unfortunately, it did a good job. We've been close to that uh, level in the in more recent history. This is in 1993, and then uh, we've had some other events where we've had some pretty good peaks as well. In most normal springs, you'll see a lake level about like this, where we might get up to a quarter or maybe close to half full. And that's just from snow melt and some additional rain. So if you come back in uh, March or April, um, you might actually see a pretty sizable, you know, 85 to 100 foot deep lake behind the dam. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, but you do your kayaking, like, do your, the, those kind of trips around then? In the springtime? Uh, it depends a little bit on what the weather conditions are and what kind of loading we have um, for debris at the takeout area too. Um, and then we're also, those those um, kayak trips all have a purpose. So generally it's looking for, um, we're either doing a, a boundary patrol or, or looking for a particular type of invasive species or some other kind of riparian assessment. So that will time that around when it's easiest to identify certain plants and that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So it could be, you know, we did one, for example, I think in August, and uh, it was so dry that they had to keep getting out of the boats and pulling it down the river. You know, this guy is a little bit miserable. <laughs> yeah, you never want to be pulling the boats. Not if you can help it. <laughs> yeah. So it's just some more exhibits in the dam. We've got some that are interactive. Uh, we have a lot of these kind of the interactive part disabled now because of the pandemic protocol, but... Um, this is one that was put together with one of our park rangers just with some images from wildlife cameras that we put out around here. And you see everything from coyotes to foxes to um, raccoons and whatever. We get, if it exists in western New York, we we have it here in the Letchworth Gorge. This is actually that video I was mentioning. We typically play this in a media room uh, on a circu circulation. And it'll be the usually one of the first stops for a school group that comes in. They'll come in and get oriented to the project by watching the video. We'll get a look down inside of the dam, but um, it's basically how it works. You've got uh, the lake that builds up on the upstream side. We have an operating gallery inside that has a series of gates on it. And we can close off one of those two gates um, however, we need to restrict it in order to get the right discharge level that we're, we're aiming to get on the downstream area. And the basic idea is once the, the forecast says that you're going to, that the river is going to get to a, a flood or a pre-flood stage, 
that's when we start closing things down in anticipation of that, building the water back here and storing it so it's not causing flooding. And then once we're able to, we'll gradually release that water and, and evacuate the pool. This is the only flood control st structure on the Genesee River watershed. So the, lucky for us, we don't actually have to do a whole lot of coordination with other, because you're right, like if you're on the Ohio River or the Monongahela or something, you got to do a whole bunch of coordination with all these yeah. different systems. But in our case, um, we're looking at up and downstream um, data collection platforms and then forecasts from the Northeast River Forecast Center that are really going to describe to us what our local situation is, is about to be and what's the river going to do. And then we make we make the decisions on gate settings. And our we rely on the water management team. Uh, uh, and the H&H &H water management team chief is Keith Korleski. He and I will be talking on a, it'll be a Sunday night in December or whatever, and, and figuring out what the plan is for gate operations for any given water event. Yeah. And he'll make the final decision on it, and then we'll we'll do the operations for it. Cool. Yeah, yeah it's a good, he's, uh, it's a good team effort there, and, and he's a great, uh, great person to have in that role. This area here is usually a kid's corner, um, and we have a, you know, kid-friendly exhibits going on in here that you can touch and feel, and unfortunately with the pandemic stuff, we can't uh, have that open right now, so we're just showing a video and stuff you can look at. And over here we have a timeline of uh, some uh, major core projects to help orient folks to what the Corps of Engineers does across the globe and what it's historically um, participated in and helped build. Some highlights from the Buffalo District in particular. Oh, nice. There's usually interactive. There's a question on here, and then you open it to reveal the answer. But I'm not supposed to have folks touching and feeling things at this time, just to help us with sanitization. And similarly, we've got a, a district and MSC boundary map here. A little, this is a little interactive map that uh, talks about some kind of more recent stuff within the Buffalo District and shows the district uh, boundary there, too. And if, uh, if we flip that up and engage that, they have, it'll show you where it is and has a little sound clip that goes along with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of this stuff has been here for... Um, at least 15 or 20 years, and this was a second iteration. Some of these have been around for as long as the visitor center has been here. You, you can almost tell, you know. This is actually the old main entrance door inside of the dam. It's, I think it looks cool. It's got the etched glass castle in it. Um, you know, it's got that kind of art deco, looks like a Gotham City kind of kind of look, you know, stuff that was built in the 50s. And, uh, and you'll see stuff in the dam that kind of looks that way still. And some of the exhibits inside, there's some uh, things that were used during construction of the dam. Um, you can see some survey instruments and stuff like that. Um, and then, and that's actually a hard hat uh, that was used on site. That's a segment of cable that was used as part of the cableway where they'd sling buckets of concrete across the side of the gorge. That's pretty beefy. Um, and then you can see stuff from the Cold War era. So the, the dam was actually designated as a fallout shelter during the Cold War, and there's a Geiger counter. Um, and Geiger counters and rations were stored in the dam as recently as, uh, as 2008, 2009. So we still, you know, we were opening up some survival crackers and seeing how they fared after, after half a century.